Hello, my friends, and welcome back. Thank you very much for being with me again today. I have about seven topics for this video. But before that, I gotta tell you that today I'm gonna go to the Sleeping Bear Dunes National Park. I will make a video over there going down the dunes and maybe discussing some um, developments, geopolitical issues here. So, in the meantime, let me go over some uh, issues important issues, developments on this planet. So I said about uh, seven, maybe seven to eight topics. Let's start with the first one. The first one is a um, Russian success, which is the Russians, Russian troops were able to break through the defenses of the left flank of the Ukrainians in Kursk. So if you remember the Ukrainians, whomever are backing up that invasion, invaded Russia in Kursk and the left flank is broken. That is bad situation for the Ukrainians. That's the first topic. Second one, Russia's, I would say, massive drone attack on Ukraine. We're going to discuss that one. Uh, tonight, uh, occurred tonight, last night, from the 10th on to the 11th of um, October. So that's Thursday to Friday. The Russian forces liberate two more towns in Donetsk Oblast in the east. That tells me that these guys break the front over there. These guys liberate, they go to, uh, towards Pokrovsk. Um, hmm, the situation is not very good for uh, the NATO troops. Well, we have um, the next topic. Russia launched the fourth attack in a week on Ukraine's grain exporting Odessa region. So the Ukrainians claim that the Russians are just destroying their um, ability to get revenue, sending their crop, their grain. Therefore, you know, their uh, fantastic standard of living and success economic story of Ukraine will crumble now. Remember, Ukraine has not had a mm, prosperous life since I can remember when maybe when it was uh, re-allowed um, to be a country in 1991 or 1992, 1994. When was it allowed? When uh, the uh, uh, Soviet Union just uh, agreed to say bye-bye? It was 1991. But nevertheless, uh, the Russians attack civilian grain ships, according to the Ukrainians. Lithuania is getting ready for war with Russia. Definitely is getting. It's installing dragon teeth for a Russian invasion. Like the Russians are going to invade. I think the Russians will take the easy way, clip, boom, and then they will just walk through. Next one. The president of the Russian Federation meets the president of Iran. I have two articles here. One discussing or telling us, informing us, reporting of the meeting between the two leaders. And then the other one is how the West interprets Putin's um, being isolated. But Putin meets Netanyahu, Putin meets the president of Iran, Putin meets the guys in Africa, in Asia, South America and all that from Europe. And somehow they are isolated. These guys who don't meet many, many people, they are not uh, isolated. Right, so th that's another topic. And we have here the, uh, another topic of Hungary. Hungary seems to be an independent sovereign country. Why? Because it pursues a, an independent foreign policy, unlike the European Union and most of the baboon vassal states over there. So the foreign minister of Hungary, Mr. Peter Ziarto, who I like very much, not because I like him in that way, no, because he's smart, he's knowledgeable, he's got balls, and he, he, he seems like he fights for his people, the Hungarian nation. And um, he tells us how much pressure is put on his country by uh, evil Russians, you think? No, no, by the good Americans to impose sanctions on Russia, don't buy Russian oil, and have a good standard of living for its people. Peter Ziarto makes a point that the foreign policy of a sovereign independent country is independent. And uh, obviously that's not true for the European Union. There is a um, 
if you're familiar with it, if not, I will let you know. Um, the, um, Hungary has a, um, how do you call it, a petroleum business called MOL, M-O-L. Hungary doesn't have oil. Hungary doesn't have oil, but has oil from whenever it purchased. So MOL agreed to extend the purchase of buying Russian oil for one more year. I think they know something we don't, which is the war might be stopping by them by then, and they will be allowed to continue doing business with the Russians. And Peter Siarto, also the foreign minister of Hungary, participated, attended a Russian energy forum. And he says, so, independent uh, foreign policy for so-called independent sovereign countries. And the last, a last uh, article here that I have, a uh, topic, has to do with something that I guarantee you, you as a country would not agree, which is foreigners being able to hold officer positions in your army. Like, let's say, um, Lloyd Austin, general, I know he's the Secretary of Defense, not of the offense of a war, no, it's defense, we all always defending ourselves. Like, he would be just uh, appointed, hold an uh, officer position of, let's say, marshal in Ukraine. Totally legal. It's like, let's say, in whatever country you, you, you are, let's say, the defense minister or a general from Russia could be an officer in your army with the same rank. Where have you saw this before? I haven't. Now, I think it's a preparation and we'll see. I make a little prediction. It's crazy. The prediction is, is crazy. Do you remember that baboon uh, called Vindman? Remember J uh, Colonel Vindman? Now, Vindman uh, was a Jewish guy who immigrated to United States of America as a boy from Ukraine. He's a colonel and he, if you remember a while ago, he was offered by the Ukrainian government a position while he was serving uh, under the US military. He was offered a position in the Ukrainian military at that time, an advisor or a rank and so on. And he said, uh, I don't know yet. Uh, let's see. Let's uh, see how the smoke um, disperses and then we're going to find out. I think this could be one of those little catapults for Mr. Vindman who's going to be just appointed over there as I, uh, and promoted to probably the rank of general in the Ukrainian army. I'm just throwing that out over there. Remember, Vindman is the same uh, how to go, club member with Zelensky Stein, with Mihal Stein, with Reznikov Stein, with Yermak Stein, with Blinken Stein, with Mallorca Stein, with Shops Stein, with who, 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 a lot of people. Uh, the, what, the Prime Minister of France Stein, and many others. But hey, this is a coincidence. But there's no coincidence with the Romanians. <laughs> I'm hearing, I'm listening. Or the Hungarians uh, having positions everywhere. All right, let's start with the beginning. The new voice of Ukraine. Russian troops break through Ukrainian defense forces left flank in Kursk Oblast. So this is the new voice of Ukraine reports from the deep state. This is Five hours ago, where is that located? Here, this is, uh, let's make it like this. This is Kursk. This is the border between Ukraine and Russia. There you have it. See, this is where the war occurs, right here. And this is the invading troops, the invading hordes, right here. And this is the left flank. Now, this is broken by the Russians. That means if these guys are capable to advance here, this way, now they can cut everything in half. These guys can be surrounded over there or encircled, however you want to call it. So this is what they're talking about, left flank. And I'm quoting, today was an extremely difficult day near Novoivanovka. Art artillerymen and drone operators had to enter the battle. <sighs> Bad, the report said. The Russian forces have recently concentrated significant military equipment and personnel in this area, analysts noted. And I'm quoting, although the first attempts achieved tactical success near Snagost, they were eventually completely halted until 
today. They clarified and they show you exactly where that is. And that is right here in this area. Russian forces are now attempting to set de defense, defense, probably defenses near settlements of Novo Ivanovka and the Leni Slyakh. Deep State described the tactical situation for adjacent Ukrainian units to the north as extremely unreliable. The weak coordination of Ukrainian forces in Kursk Oblast marks another challenge. And I'm quoting The Ukrainian grouping in Kursk Oblast is a large hodge, hodgepodge with corresponding levels of co coordination. The vibe the vibe well maybe let's don't go to this restaurant i don't uh, receive the right of vibe like me crazy on the day as unfortunate as it sound it is the disabling of the defense forces tank by an fpv drone from the defense forces the analysts also warned that repeating mistakes of this kind could lead to another disaster right okay so that's the first one next one Ukrainska Pravda. This is from uh, today, 11th of October, Friday. Ukraine's air forces downs 60 Russian drones out of 60, 60, 66, 66 launched. Now you're going to find out tomorrow about, I don't know, 12 oblasts don't have power. But hey, the success here is fantastic. You see over there, that's 90% or so, right? About 90% of, uh, of how many these guys did. Great job. And this is the evidence. You see that one, two, three, four, five. You can count them. They're exactly 60, according to this, right? The Russians launched two missiles and 66 drones to attack Ukraine on the night of 10 to 11 October, 29 of which have been shot down, while 31 disappeared from radar, right? So then we do what? So we, we do exactly 60. The enemy attacked Ukraine with an Iskander M ballistic missile launched from temporary occupied territory of Crimea, a KH-31P air-to-surface missile from the airspace of the Black Sea and 66 attack drones launched from Kursk, Russia during the night of 10 to 11 of October 2024. The Air Force had managed to down 29 drones in now Kiev, Cherkasy, Vinitsia, Sumy, Poltava, Dnipopetrovsk, Kharkiv, Chernihiv, and Zitomir Oblast as of 11 a.m. Where is that located? I will show you. Halfway, half of Ukraine. So that is Zitomir, Vinitsia, until here. So the Russians did not attack the Romanian, uh, Hungarian, and Polish um, territories uh, in the future. Not the Romanians, because they're baboons. Why? They will uh, do what they're told. And the Poles will take this one. I will say this until the cows come home. Or is that the way you say it? <laughs> All right. 31 enemy drones disappeared from radar in various regions of Ukraine, like likely due to active electronic warfare countermeasures. Two attack drones returned towards Russia. Four drones are currently still in Ukrainian airspace. So we have from 60 to 66. So two attack drones returned. So that's uh, 62. And then four drones are still sightseeing in Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian airspace. Next one. Sputnik. Russian forces liberate Ostrovskoye in the Donetsk People's Republic. The village of Ostrovskoye lies five kilometers east of Kurakovo on the southern shore of the Kurakoro Reservoir. Its liberation helps secure the flank of the group advancing on Kurakovo from the direction of Marinka. All right, where is that located? Marinka, that sounds very familiar with Avdivka. Marinka, if I remember correctly, it was sound down here on the bottom. Marinka, right here. And this is what we're talking about, the reservoir. This is Marinka. You see it? Hey, you see it? Okay, thank you for confirmation. So they did something in this area with this reservoir. Russian forces have liberated the settlement of Strovskoye, Papa Papa as a result, Zupu Zupu, and they also settlements of Zelanoye, Vtoryoye, uh, Vtoroye, as and Ostrovskoye and Donetsk People's Republic have been liberated. So Tsvai, Tsvo, two, two of them, the ministry stated. Alright, but this we're gonna find out from Barons. 
Russia says captured two more villages in East Ukraine. And we have here, Russia said Friday its forces has captured the frontline villages of Zelania Drugie and Ostrivskia in East Ukraine, the latest in a string of territorial gains for Russia. So this is the settlements of, and they say the same thing, were liberated. What they say in this article from Sputnik, that together with this, that, that's a Ukrainian success right here, and with in success, Ukrainian in success with this one, that gets me <clears throat> to this one. Associated Press, October 11th. Look like a Meloni. Oh my God. <laughs> Love is in the air. Hey, you would like. <clears throat> okay, let's move on. I mean, he is what? 5'2? So is it what? Like 3'9? <laughs> man, she needs a lot of high heels over there. And she has flat shoes. Good for you. That means she didn't come prepare for turnaround, baby. All right, let's move on. Russia launches fourth aerial attack in a week against Ukraine's grain exporting Odessa region. A nighttime Russian missile strike on Odessa killed at least four people. Pa, 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 pa. Latest in a series of attacks this week on a southern Ukrainian region that are likely intended to disrupt the country's grain exports. The Russians claim that they destroy ammunition uh, carrying vessels. Four Russian missiles and drone attacks on the Odessa region this week have killed pa, 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 pa. The strike have hit merchant ships and damaged port infrastructure in the region, which is a vital hub for Ukraine's agricultural exports through the Black Sea. Where is that located? I will show you. This is right here. So this is the Crimean Peninsula. This is the Baboonish, Baboonish, Baboonstein right here. <laughs> I think that's I will, I will call it from now on because it missed the definition. And here is Odessa. <laughs> here is Odessa. So this area was again attacked the fourth time on this week. This is the Black Sea. All right, where are we? Yeah. An attack on Odessa late Wednesday killed, okay, I don't know, we're going to look over that one, Panamanian flag, that's the one they said, the Russians said it was carrying uh, European Union weapons. So with that, I read that the big international insurance companies for these vessels just skyrocket the price. That is, like you have your car, the insurance just skyrocketed. Why? Because they have to pay. So if they have to pay, they immediately climb it. Now I have a little question for American, American friends, American, whomever. You own a car? Now, why would you, for instance, let's say you buy a car when you are 20, 20. And then you have to buy insurance over and over and over again. So let's say when you get by 40, let's say you haven't had any accidents that um, uh, implicated your insurance. So you didn't withdraw, you didn't take any money that you put in every month. Now, why wouldn't you at that uh, some point just stop paying because you paid enough? When you paid the amount of a new car, you know, let's say in 20 years, the monthly payments that you made, let's say that got to a buying a car. Why would you need to pay from 40 to, I don't know, to whenever you die and, or until you make an accident? You, um, um, and, and when that happens, they will pay the insurances from the money you, you invested, you, you paid. Why do you always have to pay for that? There was a good question uh, that someone else raised and I said, yeah, that's a good point. So why not? You know exactly why. So I, I propose that after a certain time, when you make the calculation that you paid uh, and you paid enough for these guys to cover, why would you keep paying? I'm, a, I'm against mandatory insurance uh, for the car anyway. That's me. Why? I mean, I pay for something that uh, I don't use in case something happens. When it happens, I figure things out then. No, like for instance, if that's the case, why aren't we having uh, universal health care? A car is more important than your health? I don't think so. So why don't we have health care? But hey, you say, Emil, but you can pay for your health care insurance if you want from your own money. Oh, that's great. That's great. Because that's what happens in civilized countries. You have to be bankrupt if you're not insured. 
if you have, God forbid, a medical intervention, let's say a surgery, that I'm very aware of right now, someone had to pay for a, a surgery, a uh, bone broken, about $65,000. Hey, the guys are not Americans. $65,000 for a surgery for a broken bone. Is that fair? Now, who has $65,000? How do you get that if you're not insured? If you're bankrupt because that bill will never go away. And Biden will not make everybody else pay for it, um, pay for you taking from everybody else like they do with... Um, yeah, those uh, loans that people took for the education, for um, basket uh, weaving classes and degrees or that kind of dances or you remember the Silence of the Lamb, that guy who's a... I, I would fuck myself. Mm. I remember the guy who puts over there. Uh, yeah, for that kind of dance. <laughs> you know how he's like... Mm, yeah. Mm. All right. I love it. I love that actor in that movie fantastically. It was the, the bad guy. It was the bad guy. I would fuck myself. All right, let's uh, go to the Telegraph and find out how Lithuania is getting ready for war with Russia and is going to win. <laughs> okay. Lithuania installs dragon teeth to fend off potential attack. <laughs> Look at this. Look at this, man. Where is this located? They close the border. They have a border. Lithuania doesn't have a border. Oh, the border they have is with Kaliningrad. So, oh my God, these guys is, is like the little dogs barking like a lion. Why? Because they are at the shade of the big dog. It's just, as I said many times, in, if you watched uh, Simba, the Lion King, little uh, um, cartoons, whatever you want to call them. And it was Scar, the great lion, and it was Simba the lion. And Scar had around him some um, uh, hyenas. And hyenas were always tough when Scar was around. The lion, the black uh, maned lion. And I liked. Why? He had character. You know, he has like flair. He was, uh, how do you call that? Uh, uh, man. He was uh, noble in his behavior. He had a certain kind of nobility. The other one was like, but I'm winning. <laughs> Okay. So anyway, the hyenas were always <laughs> whenever uh, they got Scar around. When Scar is, was not around and they met Simba somewhere at the bar. <laughs> Hello, I have a good vibe. Now, this is Lithuania. Hello, if United States of America, let's say it doesn't exist. I'm not saying it uh, doesn't exist. Do you think Lithuania will do the same thing? Do you think these countries all around the world would speak to Russia, the guys who dare right now to speak with Scar as they dare. Do you think they will just uh, speak like that? No, they will speak normally. They will come to their senses because they will know the proportion. Who are you? Move. But here, these guys are getting ready to fight the Russians. Uh, Lithuania has 2.8 million people. 2.8, if I remember correctly. That's a half of a city. In, in China, it's not even a city, it's a semi-village. <laughs> but they are ready, right? They're ready. Lithuania has installed dragon teeth, anti-tank barriers on bridges that link the country to Russia. Its defense ministry also said firepower had been built around another fortified bridge over the Niman River to stop the potential Russian attack. Fortification will be supported by firepower bum, 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 in case it's needed to stop and destroy the, <laughs> the enemy. My God! Now, the Neman River from forms part of Lithuania's border with Russia's Kaliningrad's enclave. It is 580 miles long and flows from Belarus through Lithuania and then into the North Sea. This is... The problem is this. You have baboons out there. I'm pretty sure you met them. And the baboons don't know sizes, don't know history. I mean, probably they know one size fits all. <laughs> okay. So they don't know this kind of thing. They don't know only 20. When they say Baltic states, they imagine, oh my God. Uh, Baltic states together have a total population of 6.1 million people. They want to fight the Russians. And... Uh, it's uh, Estonia. Estonia wants to fight Russia. Estonia, I think, have around, it has about uh, 1 million people. Estonia has 24% of its population uh, ethnic Russians. And they want to fight the Russians? 
imagine how many people you have over there that maybe they don't swear allegiance to your bullshit. So people don't know these kind of things. That's why when they say, well, the Zulu Empire. Why? Most people know about the Roman Empire. Right? So when you say hey, Zulu Empire, they say, oh, Zulu Empire, yeah, because the Zulus have a senate, they had buildings, they have uh, columns, you know, they have all kind of uh, beautiful roads that you can still study right now. They have, you know, philosophy, all that, like, like Rome. No, no, but they put the name Empire, attach it to, and I gave Zulu because it was a low-hanging fruit. I can give you. It happened in uh, in anthropology class at the Michigan State University when I took one of them. I was like, "Holy fuck! What are you talking about?" And the woman uh, professor she told us about the Zulu Empire. How? Bu -bu 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 -bu. Uh, yeah, you need about one hundred uh, armed uh, red coats to show up and figure things out in the Zulu Empire. Anyway, friends, let's move on. Let's see. What's going on between Putin and the president of Iran? CNN. Putin hails very close links with Iran at landmark first meeting with president as Middle East tensions soar. Why did they soar? <laughs> we got Al Capone. President, uh, Russian president Vladimir Putin said he shares very close worldview with his Iranian counterpart. Let me align and allied. Counterpart Masoud Pezeskian. This to me sounds um, Armenian, the name Pezeskian, but hey, that's me. Um, as the sanctioned leader held a friendly inaugural meeting just as the Middle East braces for Israel's response to Tehran's uh, latest ever missile attack last week. The meeting at the regional summit in Ashgabat, the capital of the Central Asian country Turkmenistan, also comes against a backdrop of close military ties between Iran and Russia's military in recent years, particularly since the invasion of Ukraine of blah, blah, blah. Okay, so let's see, Iran has supplied, now, now this is a given, from we don't know, likely, now it's a given, Iran has supplied thousands of Shahids. Yeah, they purchased them. And the missiles, I want to see if they have missiles. They have missiles too. All right, here, this is a statement already. Iran also recently transferred short-range ballistic missiles to Russia to use in a war against Ukraine. CNN reported in September, making significant escalation. Let me see if they reported it as being a fact or it's just, uh, uh, you know, maybe, yes, could be, doesn't work. All right. Uh, we are actively working together in the international arena and our assessments of events taking place in the world are often very close. Since Ukraine, the two countries, pop, 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 boop, 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 obviously they work in the BRICS, there's going to be in the BRICS, right? There is a perception in Moscow that Iran can reach Russia and about the tools of evade san sanctions. TTT to do to being part of BRICS. That's good. I want to see how these guys report it. So this guy attended October BRICS summit in Russia, was invited and he will, where the two countries are expected to sign a comprehensive strategic agreement. You got it? There are the relationships are relations is at all time high. So this thing with, um, uh, how do you call it, the missiles, the sh short, this is reported by some who think that way. And from the think, that's a fact right here. Recently transferred, that's a statement. Okay. According to these guys, right, they, they reported. Next one, let's see how the, these guys are interpreting, interpreting this meeting. Semaphore, Putin to meet Iran present as Russia flexes diplomacy despite Western sanctions. No, the Western countries, the baboons, the vassal states, they sanctioned themselves, most of them, and they isolated themselves. So it's not like Russia is isolated and flexes diplomacy. But the fact is, the reality is, Putin had more meetings with more countries' leaders than Biden had. I'm not talking about the United Nations where you go over there and you meet them like that or something. No, 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 no. Like in your country, visiting your country. Oh, look at the, um, they had the African summit, about what, 52 countries showed up out of, out, of, out of 54 with leaders, prime ministers and so on. That's one of them. BRICS, he showed, he, he, they're going to have the, uh, they're going to organize the summit. Not only that, he meets Iranian prime minister, uh, president, he met Netanyahu a while ago, he speaks with these guys, he doesn't speak with about what? They're, because those guys are not allowed to speak with him, not because he wouldn't. He can speak with everybody, but the other guys got the order not to speak with him. We have to isolate him. 
So remember, I always give you this uh, example. Uh, the West isolates Putin. How? We got a world with about 193, 194 countries. Correct? Correct. Now, let's say that's a party. And we have uh, the West, which is United States of America, Great Britain, France, sometimes Germany, and maybe Italy. Uh, Canada and these guys are considered West, but they are... All right? And the rest are fossil states. Actually, it's only one leader, which is United States of America, the plantation guy, Al Capone. Then you have the slaves, you know, cutting sugar cane over there on the plantation. And you got the house slave or servant, which is Great Britain. That's how it is. So those guys over there don't say squat. This guy sucks it whenever the master wants. And that's the plantation. There's about 30 to 40 countries. That's about it. Out of 193. So let's get 40. So these guys, the 40, show up at the party, and all together in the party, that's 193 people. And you're 40. So how much is the other one? So it's about what? 153. So 153 are over there, Putin included, and we are here 40. And we say, you know what? We're going to isolate that guy. So we're not going to talk to those guys, man. Who isolates who? The 153? are isolated or the 40 baboons are isolated. So this is the isolation of Putin. Putin speaks with everybody else, 150 countries, and he can speak with these guys as well from the 40 baboons. And the, uh, how is that? Al Aladdin and the 40 thieves? Ha! That's what I'm going to call them. Just down. So Aladdin, Aladdin and the 40, it was 40 or 42? 40, I think. 40 thieves. That's how these guys are. <laughs> oh my God. See? All right, I just farted something online, like, ooh. All right, so let's move to the next one. Hungary. Sputnik, Budapest, under pressure to end energy cooperation with Russia, Foreign Minister Peter Siarto. Why? Why? I met a uh, Hungarian-Romanian um, uh, woman a while ago, and um, we're spoke, speaking about Siarto, and what she told me was that she, Siarto is not a good guy, she couldn't mention any policies, but she said that he dressed in Armani and he's always, you know, uh, like, uh, mm. that was her problem with him. And I asked, okay, but what policy you don't like about? What did he say? The problem was, look how he did, how decent he looks. He's too nice, just nicely dressed, and he likes to be, you know, to respect himself. There you have. You look good, man. Good job. Keep it up. Let's move on. So... St. Petersburg, Budapest is facing external pressure aimed at ma making it end its energy cooperation with Russia. Hungarian Foreign Minister Peter Siato said on Thursday, and I'm quoting, regardless of all the threats and friendly advice by friends and allies, we were brave enough to build the Turkish Stream Pipeline. And this alternative can have not only Hungary, but other countries in Central Europe who might be facing a changing situation because of the cutting of a transit through Ukraine. That means we're not going to get blackmailed. Ziarto said at St. Petersburg International Gas Forum 2024, we do not mean to replace already existing reliable sources because you would only replace an existing source in two cases. First, if you are not satisfied with it, or second, if you have a better alternative. From the perspective of Hungary, we are satisfied with the ongoing energy cooperation with Russia, with Russian energy company Gazprom, Ziarto said, because it's about the Hungarian people, not the guys in, how do you call it, in um, Brussels. All contracts have been respected so far and deliveries have been arriving on time. Whenever we needed additional volumes, we were able to make an agreement. Secondly, is there a better alternative or not? Is there a better offer? I have to say no. That's what he said. Correct. That's exactly what Mr. Jay Shankar, Dr. Jay Shankar, who again I like very much, the foreign minister of India, said the same thing. We are here in the business of making sure that our people, our nation, has enough for its survival and for its economic boom. Uh, who are you to tell me that? You work against my national interest. So that's the first one. Let's go to the to the next article. Sputnik, Hungarian oil giant MOL delays shift to non-Russian crude by one year. Why? They hope the war stops by then. And the Russians uh, or the other, whomever, 
All right. Hungarian oil company MOL expects its refineries in Hungary and Slovakia to be able to switch from refining Russian, refining Russian to non-Russian oil by the end of 2026, a year later than planned because certain projects have been postponed. MOL's vice president for strategy and sustainability, Viktor Sverla, said, there are investments underway that we could increase this to 100% by the end of 2026. Sverla told Reuters Thursday, MOL can refine up to 30 to 40% non-Russian crude oil at its refineries in Slovakia and Hungary and DPA, Hungary's foreign minister defends attending Russian energy forum. Peter Giard, much, much younger here. And you can tell <laughs> by the tie that Mr. Uh, what's his name? Giardo is doing good. <laughs> Don't you? Don't you think? Look at that. Mm, Bond. James Bond. And here. Oh, my name is what? My name is what? <laughs> Slim Shady. And here it is. Foreign policy is a part of sovereignty and we allow no one to restrict this sovereignty. He was reported as saying correctly. Correctly. Now look at how independent your country is in Europe. The foreign policy of each country in the European Union could have, has the right to have an independent foreign policy. But nevertheless, you can't uh, jeopardize uh, the European Union's, uh, you know, safety and security. That, get, that gets me to the last article coming from Ukraine Forum. Foreigners to be able to hold officer positions in AFU, a RADA's decision. The Verkhovna RADA has adopted a law regarding the procedure for military service by contract for foreigners and stateless person in the armed forces of Ukraine, the state special transport service and the National Guard, which allows for the possibility of serving in officer positions. Got it? Got it. The law addresses critical issues regarding the service of foreigners in the armed forces of Ukraine, the state special transport services. So that means if tomorrow, if this guy says yes, that's the way it's going to be. Tomorrow, um, these guys decide that they make a little um, deploy, <laughs> not depart department, um, let's put a department within the um, Ukrainian uh, armed forces and they call it Tsapa Kappa and in Tsapa Kappa they say anybody from NATO, officers NATO, could go over there and uh, serve. They do in Tsakapaka right there. Tsakapaka will be full of foreigners with their officers. Who are the officers? NATO officers. Or we're gonna have the Vinman, that baboon, being appointed somewhere over there. So that is bringing NATO troops normal and their, and their commanders under, I don't know, that department, Sapa Kappa. Thank you very much for being with me again today. Stay strong, stay smart, look for the truth, and be just.